When I'm in airports or trains, buses, I watch people, but not in a creepy sort of way. I watch them because I want to know what motivates them, what will get them involved in the world. And this obsession that I have with transportation really comes from my grandfather, because when I was a teenager, um, he had saved up. In fact, he never bought a new tractor as a poor farmer. He saved up his whole life, taught himself electronics and mechanics, and then he traveled the world because he'd read very much. And he would send us postcards, and when he came home, we'd look at pictures and pour over maps. And I became obsessed with maps, and I thank my grandfather father for that. This is his suitcase. He came to Turkey. It doesn't go. Um, maps are stories, and every map story, John, there we go. Maps are stories, and when you think about maps, they, they do tell stories. They tell stories of geography, of history, and they're really globe-sized. And each map, when you look at a world map, you get a real sense of just how massive our planet is. And maps have, because maps have always been stories, they can share and change how we view the world. But what if maps weren't just static? What if they were interactive? What if they could affect change? And that's the question that my colleagues at Ushahidi started to ask. Um, Ushahidi means testimony in Swahili, which means to give voice. And they, they decided to create this map as a result of election violence that occurred in Kenya in 2008. And the map itself is an aggregation of data they found online. So they asked this question, what do you see, what do you hear? And they compiled reports from SMS, from mobile phones, from Twitter, from Facebook, from email, from web forms. They took those and they asked people to add them to the map. And so by doing that, each of those dots you see is a report that somebody's filed about situations. So all the different categories are the situations that were occurring in Kenya. So it became this global picture of what was happening in the country that was not given by any other news agency. And it was citizens helping each other and telling their own story. So they decided that this, this should be open source, that anybody in the world, any group, any individual should be able to tell their own story. And so they made this freely available and open source for people to tell their story. So Ushahidi has been used around the world for elections. In Liberia, it was used during uh, the last year elections. And so every single dot that you see there is a report. And they train students and they train non-government associations to be able to file those reports and to collect and to add that. So what was happening in the country? And the UN mission actually, UN mission in Liberia actually said this was the most comprehensive picture of what was happening in Liberia during the elections. So it's citizens helping citizens, telling stories, using mobile phones, using whatever they could find in order to be able to do that. So not only is Ushahidi, which is information collection, visualization, and interactive mapping, not only has it been used for election monitoring, it has also been used for emergency response. This is a map from Christchurch last year in New Zealand. And at 8.30 that night, I saw a Twitter message, and I knew instantaneously that I should log online with an international group of volunteers of people who believe that mapping information means sharing information. And they're called crisis mappers. And so we logged online, and I knew overnight all of us from different different organizations, whether it be Google Crisis Response or Sahana or Ushahidi, all of these groups got together and they created a map. And this particular map is important because it was then handed over to the people of New Zealand in Wellington, New Zealand, and they redesigned it in their own, like, their own form because they had local knowledge. And they collaborated with local folks, including a group called the Facebook Student Army, which were kids with wheelbarrows who went out and helped each other with their neighbors. What the map did was, again, what do you see, but how can I help, was the questions that they asked. They never wanted to replace emergency response. They wanted to work in concert with them. So not 
taking away from the people who were trying to get medicine or trying to get aid to people, but saying, you know what, people still need to know which pharmacies are still open. People still need to know where to get gas. They need to know which roads are closed. So these maps became layers of sharing and helping. So Ushihiri has also been used for, by many groups and individuals for civil society action, such as this. This is an energy map. Or map. When you think about environmental issues, there's all kinds of facets of what information can we learn about about our environment and our world. And all those reports on Antarctica are about peak oil. But what can kids do? This is uh, Lowell High School in San Francisco. They're an economics class. And these kids wanted to know what the cost of chicken was. And so Ushihiri became a teaching tool for these kids. And they learned where their food comes from. They learned that kids in India want to know what the cost of candy is. So they added that report to the map so the kids could know what the cost of candy was because apparently it's very expensive in India. So they were learning with the map. And so because maps have always been education tools, what if they are change tools? What if it's social entrepreneurship projects can be used around maps? And that's what happened in Kapisa, Afghanistan. These gentlemen are learning how to file reports with mobile phones. They're learning to do interactive voice response, and it's in multiple languages. They can file a report and add information asking for help about tracking wells. If wells are broken and they're not working, they can add a report, it gets geolocated and added to the map, and then someone contacts them back and then teaches them how to fix that. So they have the ownership, they have the power with this to not only see what is happening in the country, but also to help each other. And what's really powerful about this is that the Afghan Ministry for Rural Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation and Development, eventually there will be 100,000 wells tracked throughout Afghanistan, and they will be in charge of it. It will be in their language. But what can one individual do? This gentleman, his name is Shamir, and I have a real soft spot for Shamir because he, he, he feels that we need to talk more about violence against women, and we need to understand what is happening throughout his country. So he has taken it upon himself to find reports, anything he can find. So he set up a mobile phone where people can call in, and text mess or text message. They can send Twitter messages, they can send Facebook messages, they can send email, they can add a web form, and in fact, they can go and look to the helplines and get information. And so not only is he trying to amplify that this is a problem and to show this is a problem, he is also trying to give resources so that people can help each other. And so the map becomes this community where people are collaborating around it and that this becomes a new change. And now he is not an NGO, he's not a non-government association. He's one man who's decided that this is the topic that he's most impassioned about, that we need to visualize what's happening, we need to collect information about it, and we need to stop it. But what about digital volunteers? Um, there's a group called the Standby Task Force, and this is Melissa Elliott, she's in Canada. And um, you can see her teaching right there. She, she is the core, one of the core team leaders of the Standby Task Force. There's 750 volunteers around the world who will volunteer during an emergency anywhere in the world if asked. And they were asked by the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs last year, help us find information about Libya. They didn't have a map, a comprehensive map of, of Libya. But they asked these digital volunteers in partnership, can you find information for us. So these people went with all seriousness, and that was a really hard, hard map to do. Um, they went and found whatever information they could find. They geolocated it. It got added to the map. Some of it was redacted and not shared online. It was anonymized because we wanted to talk about security. We want to be very secure in how you're sharing information. What's important about this is that um, on one thing, they changed the UN's method for information collection. It was the first time that United Nations had worked with digital volunteers in this way. And it changed how they process information. But it also has changed how we interact because there's time zones throughout the world and people would pass off overnight and help each other. So it was a four to five week project where digital volunteers were working. In Japan last year during the earthquake, the Japanese volunteers from the OpenStreetMap Foundation, led by a, a lovely, passionate man named Helseki, wanted to find out what was happening in Japan. And so what he did was he created an Ushihiri instance. 
He at, created on OpenStreetMap, digital free maps, and he aggregated with his team of hundreds of volunteers 12,000 reports of what was happening throughout the country of Japan. And what's interesting as well about this is that they had people helping to find hospitals, people in need connected to hospitals. And it was in their language, it was them helping each other. Not a lot of international people worked on the particular data collection. And most of the content came from Twitter because phone lines were down. And the other thing that's most interesting is there were a million page views in the first month. You would think that the views would be other parts of the world because we're curious and want to know what's happening. No, they were in the Sendai region. So again, a map about people, for people, about their story and their community. It's also been used for activism. Uh, this is Occupy Wall Street. Uh, these folks have added a wiki. They've added more comprehensive picture integration into their map to be able to do it. And they organize their, their, all their organized events are around it. So you start to think about how do we change visualization to be able to tell a full picture? Well, that, that's, a, that's something that they've highly customized. And again, it's their action, their work that they've been using Ushihidi for. But what about feeling? I mean, when I say maps connect us and we're connected with that, what I think is important about um, this particular map in terms of sentiment mapping is that Al Jazeera, in partnership with two, uh, two technical companies and Ushahidi and the African Diaspora Initiative, they created this map last December. And they, create, they sent out uh, 8,000 text messages to Somali citizens and ask them this question, how has the last few months of crisis affected your lives? And they received 4,000 text messages back. They translated and aggregated and added to the map 1,000 messages. And they are, some of them, quite heartbreaking. But diaspora communities were connected with the Somali folks that received these text messages. And there are heartbreaking messages on this map, and it's their story. Uh, one woman said, we lost a whole generation of grandmothers. And, and so, so you start to think about how does a map tell a story? How does it connect us? What, 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 what is the potential of helping during an emergency? What is the potential of helping elsewhere? And what is the connectedness? And how does it tell these people's story? What if this happened in Turkey? What if there was an emergency in Turkey? Now, this particular map was the first Ushahidi map that was done in the country of Turkey. It was done by Al Jazeera last year during the Van earthquake. You will see that it is in some of the Turkish language. And you will also see there's not very many reports so far. So I would ask that if, if there is an emergency in your country, that you should know that there are digital volunteers around the world who will want to work in partnership with you to help. There are, there are people here in your country who are already starting, who have that entrepreneurship understanding of mapping information and sharing across borders. They exist here now. And that in partnership, you can look beyond just your institutions and your government, but you can look to each other. Because what we have learned from digital mapping is that it's about the partnerships and the networks that you have offline that come online, like a gentleman spoke about this morning. and that. By doing that in your local language, with your understanding of your geography and your history, you can affect change in your country, much like other people are there. So you will not be alone, but this is something that can come from you. And the last part is, is that this digital journey that I've been on has been quite, quite the roller coaster. I'm not sure that my grandfather, when I started politics, knew that um, I would end up talking about mapping in Turkey, of all places. Um, but when the earthquake in Haiti happened last, uh, in 2010, um, I received a Facebook message at 9.36 at night. And it said, and I worked in technology my whole career and was feeling kind of disinfected. And didn't feel like I was involved in my world. And I received this Facebook message and I thought, OK. It said, what can technologists do? What can communicators do? And my hand shook all night, and I, I watched the TV, and was watching this emergency. And I got on that phone that next morning to this conference call of other people who wanted to be part of change. And 
I met these people, these crisis mappers, these people who create software for social good, these people who want to use their knowledge differently. And I will spend the rest of my career on this journey of how do we use our knowledge for good and how do we use our technology for good. And when you think about social entrepreneurs, that's exactly what they're doing. How do we tie technology and knowledge for good acts within our community, whether it be water or environment or institutional changes or what have you. Each one of them is trying to figure out how do you combine those aspects. So I would ask you to consider what you could do in that capacity. But the digital journey itself for individuals, for mappers and groups of mappers, these people can do it either together or alone. And each one will go with a different kind of mission. And what, what is most inspiring about their work is that they are, they are changing institutions. They're changing governments. They're changing how people work with governments and institutions, whether it be me talking to the Canadian government or these folks who'd worked on the Libya map, working with the UN. That idea of governments talking with citizens, this is something that can happen. This is where businesses can work with citizens. And the opportunity to be able to do that kind of change can only come if you ask yourself, why not? So thank you.